so I have a question for you. If, if you and your family were walking along on the street, and either, you know, you might have seen those kind of man-on-the-street interviews before, and somebody comes up to you with a microphone, which I think at that point you just kind of like forget everything logical that you would say after that, because it's like the microphone just brings all this pressure, you know. But So maybe not that high pressure of an environment, but, but if you're walking along on the street with your family, and you're having a conversation with someone, and someone says something to the effect of, hey, would you tell me a little bit about how your family works? Uh, you might say something like, well, okay, what do you mean? Like, what are you, what are you looking for here? What, what, what can I tell you? Well, if they said in response, what are your goals? Uh, what's the structure in your family like? What are each person's kind of responsibilities in your family? As you prepare to answer, you might kind of survey the family members. Everybody kind of gets a smirk on their face like, oh, I want to tell them, Right? I saw on a show recently, uh, I don't know what it was, but uh, they were asking a couple of questions, and, and uh, one of the kids was like, he said something like, oh, I'd, oh, it was America's Funniest Videos, and, and he said like, oh, now we don't want to make you, you know, fight here or anything like that, and some, you know, like, oh, no, they do it all the time, right? You know, we've had that moment where, you know, our kids are like, oh, no, they fight all the time, it's, you know, that's fine, right? And it's like, oh, yeah, okay, we have to train you better on what to say, what to not, but, you know, there, there might be this sheepish grin or kind of this coy um, facial expression that somebody has, um, but I'd venture to say that those family members that are old, old enough, even the kids, would be able to give uh, a reasonable description of how things actually function in your home, right? Uh, they, they may describe the things that you might not want them to say, but they also might say, well, this is kind of how it works, you know, and, and these how the how mom and dad's relationships work with one another. Here's what some of our responsibilities are at home. But a, a, as a parent, a mom, a dad, a grandpa, a grandpa, how would you answer that question? Somebody comes up and says, hey, tell me how your family works. What are your goals? What's the structure like in your home? What are your priorities like? How do you decide your family goals? Well, hopefully you're thinking, oh, I remember a sermon series on that recently. But even if you're not remembering a sermon series on that, you know God's Word has plenty to say about that. And so you're thinking of passages, hopefully, that come to mind, right? Well, the same kind of question can be asked about our church family. And I'm just curious how you would answer. Somebody comes up to you on the street and says, hey, tell me about your church. Often we start talking about programs or activities or different things like that. But they said, well, tell me about your goals as a church. Tell me about your structure as a church. Tell me about your, your responsibilities as part of the church. Right? What might that look like for you? What, what would your answer be? It's an important topic. And, you know, we've seen um, over the years... As we've looked and we've gone through book studies, um, going expositionally, uh, meaning verse by verse or section by section through books of the Bible, like we've gone through books like Titus and Philippians, Ephesians, 1 John over the years. Those hopefully ring a bell to you. And each piece sort of adds uh, to the picture and focuses on individual and corporate aspects of our goals as a church, our structure, and each one's responsibility. When I say the word corporate, I just mean how we are together. In other words, we each have individual responsibilities, but together, if we're doing the responsibilities that God has called us to do, then corporately, we'll struck, we'll be, we'll, we will operate in a way that uh, brings glory to God. It'll be imperfect, to be sure, but we'll operate in that way, right? We'll understand this is kind of what, you know, this is what the deacons do as, uh, as lead servants in our church family, right? They lead out in building unity and in meeting tangible needs, all kinds of tangible needs, right? If the elders are, are, are leading as God has called us to, uh, as servant leaders, right? The elders aren't men who desire a title and just get together and make decisions, but no, they're shepherding elders or I like to call them lay pastors, right? Like a lot of times I know it's just kind of like, you know, hey, Pastor Matt, how's it going, right? I hope you would feel just the same kind of freedom, even though it might be a little different to go up to Brian Edwards and say, hey, Pastor Brian, how's it going? 
Even Brian's grimacing at that a little bit because that just is helpful to understand our culture overall. But you know what? He's one of our pastors. It's just not full time. He works a day job. A day job and a night job and a weekend job and a <laughs> in the service industry, right? I hope that you would feel comfortable going up to Kurt Rich and saying, hey, Pastor Kurt. He might have the same kind of reaction. Similarly, I pray that you would feel comfortable going up to any of the men who have served as, as elders. Right? Todd Dreesen. Hey, Pastor Todd. How you doing? What? I'm not. A... Well, yeah, you are. And they would actually know it. They know it. Uh, we've talked about serving as shepherding elders together for a long time. I mean, it's a heartbeat. Right? And we're growing in it. We pray we're always growing in it. But how would you answer those kinds of questions? Sometimes, to go back to the family and the marriage analogy, I have conversations with people who are struggling. Or maybe if you're a community group leader or you, you lead another study, you, you have somebody in your group and they're struggling in their marriage. Right? Not, not because they're unique, but because they're married. How do you know if somebody's going to struggle in their marriage? They're married. I'm not putting marriage down. I'm putting individuals who are sinful, who get committed together and say, we're in this for the long haul under God and for God's glory, and it means you're going to come with struggles. I love Paul Tripp's book. He's reworded it now. I think it's called Six Gospel Commitments Every Marriage Needs or something like that. I think we've got it at the Resource Center. But it used to be called What Did You Expect? Right? I kind of wish he had kept that title, but... Um, what did you expect? You get two sinners who come together, they agree together to be married and live together and priorities change, and, but you got to figure out what that looks like, right? It takes time. It takes dying to self each and every day. But often these conversations can kind of, you know, can kind of go like this. Um, you know, a couple comes in or, or I'm talking with somebody in a different environment and they come in and they, they, uh, they do one of these things, right? And he's pointing to her, she's pointing to him, Right? And, and so one of them says something like, uh, you know, it's usually the, the men. If men, you know, come in and they know their Bibles, they'll say something like, well, Ephesians 5, 22 and 24 talks about submission. And, uh, you know, if she would just um, follow my lead, then things would go better. Right? And it's usually the wives who like to look to the verse right before that that says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, and the verse after that that says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might purify for himself uh, his bride. I'm paraphrasing here. Building her up, sanctifying her through the washing of the water of the word, right? And they both have this sort of settled confidence, that they're right. Well, who's right? Who's right? Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot. I'm going to give you a 50-50 shot here. You ready? And here are the answers. Both or neither. Raise your hand if you agree that the correct answer is neither. You like how I did that? Nobody raise your hand. Like I gave you the answer. Raise your hand if you agree that the correct answer is neither. I know some of you are like, wait, I don't know theology. Do you know why? Because they're more concerned about making the other one conform to who they think they ought to be. Oh, they're right about the passages. There's nothing wrong with the Bible. But when I'm concerned, and there's a, something going on, something going down in my home, and I'm just concerned about somebody that we're talking to and knowing that she's the one in the wrong, there's something going on here in my heart, right? I, I want to ask questions like, well, what happened to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 through Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20 before you got to the verses that you're highlighting? What about Ephesians 5, 31 to 33, where Paul says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let his wife see that she respects her husband. 
What happened to Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2? Therefore, because of everything that's happened in chapters 1 through 4, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Or Ephesians 4, 29, just prior to that, that says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, right? It's like a good trivia question. How much corrupting talk can come out of your mouth? None. But only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Or what about Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, which talk about the body of Christ coming together, being equipped and built up by the elders who, 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 who oversee and equip the, uh, the members of the body for the work that God has called them to do, so that we, because we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, listen to the words here, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body so that it builds itself up in love. We watched, I don't know what show it was, and uh, there was this, person that was running. It was just the most awkward run that I have seen. I mean, it was intentional. It was a funny part of a show or whatever. And I just was like, that's the most awkward run I think I maybe have ever seen. I wonder what some of our churches look like as a body walking or running with ligaments that are stretched and joints that are not working properly and parts of our body that are gone. What would our walk look like as a corporate body of Christ? Or Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, all of which precedes these marriage verses, these marriage passages that people come in wanting to point the finger at. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Really, once? Or are you still walking in it? I'm not going to read the whole passage right now, but... For it is by grace, verse 8, that you've been saved. By grace you've been saved through faith, not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Or what about Ephesians 1? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us, uh, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to, to the purpose of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. But I told you last week, we're talking about the body of Christ. So today's sermon is not a, it's not a marriage sermon, right? We're talking about the body of Christ. Oh, wait a minute. Or is it? Is it a marriage sermon? Like the Apostle Paul who describes his goal. Remember the goal of family I mentioned before. His goal of ministry to the church. Now, in this context, Paul's defending his ministry, and so there's a lot going on in this context, but I want you to listen to this phrase. This is how Paul, the apostle, views the church in Corinth. He said, I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. This is how Paul views the church. And as we think about, well, how do we come together and, and how do we make decisions and how do we support one another? Today is going to be, you know, sort of like a, a flyover as we look at a variety of different passages. But I want to go back to something that I, I mentioned last week. But church, would you get this picture that we 
are the bride of Christ, gathered and scattered. We are, we are the bride of Christ as a collective corporate, I say corporate capital C, uh, around the world. We are scattered among many nations and many tribes and many peoples and languages. We, the church, capital C, are the capital B bride of Christ. And while many of our brothers and sisters are around uh, the, the county, the city, the state, the country, the nation, and the globe, we who are gathered here at Oak Grove Church are called by God to help one another accomplish at least seven wonderful responsibilities. And, and I'm less concerned with whether or not you would word things this way exactly. If you were talking to someone in town and they said, hey, tell me about your church. Tell me about your goals, your structure, your priorities. I hope it would resemble some of these things. And again, this is a list of seven. Jonathan Lehman mentions this in a, in a book, Understanding the Congregation's Authority and um, Don't Fire Your Church Members. I mentioned last week it's sort of a, an apologetic or an argument for how we describe ourselves as elder-led congregationalism. Right? At the end of the day, the buck stops with those who are, have committed to be members of Oak Grove Church. Together, you're responsible to identify who God has appointed to serve as pastor elders. Did you hear the way I said that? We work together to identify who Jesus has appointed, who God has appointed to serve as pastor elders. We're not just picking people. We have very strong biblical ramifications for who we consider and why. And that's a humbling thing to say because I don't always feel qualified for this. I'm not up here. I don't get to serve with these men because I'm any better than anybody else. I know that for sure. And yet we shouldn't shy away from how the Bible lays it out for us. So I, I'll put these on the screen and then we'll kind of go through them briefly one by one. But I want to say this first. As we look throughout the Bible, there's not a particular verse that says, here's how church should look as a whole. Right? What you see is you see snippets of it throughout the New Testament in particular when the church was brought together in Acts. But even in the Old Testament, the same, you'll see almost all these principles just worded a little different way in the Old Testament for God's people. The things that God has called his people to do together how they're called to live with one another, how they're called to help one another, right? All of these things are in the Old Testament and the New, but particularly uh, defined for us, or I should say described for us, right? You think of church membership and being a body of Christ. It's just assumed. The way we do church mem membership, how we administrate it, right? Each church can be a little different in how they kind of like do church, so to speak. But we ought to be able to identify our values and our goals and what God calls us to do from the scriptures and try to work real hard to stick as closely to that as we can. So, so here are seven. Last week I mentioned six. I didn't mention this one. The first one is attend church regularly. And I'm just going to zip through them right now. Uh, number two, help preserve the gospel message. This should be one slide with all six of them on there. Uh, help affirm gospel citizens disciple other church members, share the gospel with outsiders or with non-Christians, follow your leaders. But if we don't do number one, commit to being gathered together in the meeting, in the regular assembly, we're not going to do numbers two through six very well at all, right? In Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, the apostle Paul says, and let us consider, let us consider how we uh, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but meeting, uh, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Right? This is right after he says, let us hold fast to this confession of our hope without wavering. So there's this mutual accountability and responsibility to come together when the church gathers right? That, that definition and description, the ecclesia, the church that comes together, that gathers around what? Around Jesus, around the living Word of God. 
I said in a, a training this morning, the way we gather communicates. We communicate, we teach by gathering. People come in and they go, oh, this, oh, they sing songs. Some people are raising their hands. I don't know what that's all about, but they're singing songs. They seem to all know most of the songs. This guy's opening up this book. They are all closing their eyes and talking to somebody. I see lots of smiles and love. I see tears. Oh, I see a group of people over there with their heads bowed and praying together. At least that's what it looks like. You see what I'm saying? The way we gather, the way we do church, the way we celebrate communion, the way we have baptisms, the way we welcome people into membership, all this stuff teaches just by virtue of how we do it. Not just the content, but how we do it. We work together to help preserve the gospel message. Now, your elders are, 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 are men of God who are called to lead out in the, in the teaching of the word. That's the main distinction between de deacons and elders. All the character qualifications, all of that, those are the same. Deacon, elders are not like better men than deacons, right? You know this. They're just able, able to teach, able to open up and explain the word of God in ways that are right and helpful for you to be able to understand. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 1, 6 through 9. And I want you to notice that he's talking about himself here. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him, Jesus, who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is a different gospel, but there are some of you, there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel of heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you. Do you hear what he said? He lumps himself in there. Even if we, those who brought the gospel to you, start preaching a different gospel, let him be accursed. Nobody who comes and claims to be God's representative can preach, can proclaim anything than that salvation comes by God's grace through faith, which is a gift of God. Amen. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. In other words, he's saying, church, the responsibility is on you to listen well, to prayerfully discern what is being proclaimed to you. And if something, right, we're not talking about like if, oh, I said something wrong last week. I, several months ago, I said something. I was like, ah, I came back the next week and tried to make a correction. I said, I misspoke last week, and here's why, and uh, that sort of thing, right? But, but if somebody is proclaiming a gospel to you that is different than the gospel of grace that Oak Grove Church has stood on for 150 years, it's your responsibility to clarify to be sure you hear it right, and then to out them. And that means if it's ever me. If it's any of your elders, by God's grace, it will never be. But it's your responsibility to say, you know what? We can't stand for this. We, we are called, number three, to help affirm gospel citizens. Listen to how Paul describes it in Romans chapter 12. He says, love one another with brotherly affection. Out, we're seeing this as we're going through 1 Thessalonians, so we're taking a break for a few weeks here. Brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Friend, do you have something against another brother or sister? Are you striving to outdo them in showing honor? Or is it easy for you to get aside and kind of pull your group together, get people on your side of an issue? Paul says, have nothing to do with it. In fact, he, he goes further in the book of Titus. But sticking here, verse 11, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs and seek to, the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. This is not 
simply someone comes in the door and they say they're a Christian, and so we make them a member of the church, and then everything goes on as usual. No, we need to understand their profession of faith. We need to, to do our best, right? We're not judging their heart, but as fruit inspectors and those who have honest conversations with people trying to understand where they're at in their relationship with Jesus. And, and, and the elders and some other leaders in the church lead out in some of that work, but it, it needs to be all of us together saying, let's press in around one another to support one another, to be sure that we, we understand the gospel in the right way and giving evidence that we understand the gospel and have turned to Jesus in faith, that it's applying, that it's being applied in our own lives, that it's having an effect in our lives. It's the difference between a family who says, who answers that question that I posed at the beginning of the message and says, well, here's how things work in my family. And the kids go, "Uh uh-uh. Not at home. How do we live in that way, friends? It's important to attend members' meetings, right? We, we often have one uh, annual members' meeting a year. Sometimes we have, have more meetings throughout the year. But we often have an annual meeting in, in uh, the middle of January. We kind of celebrate what God did last year, and we, we look forward to things in the future. Honestly, I think it'd be neat to have more. Not to go over just a bunch of, you know, business items, but to be together as a group and celebrate as a large group and pray together and pray for one another. And a lot of those things we do in community groups, right, throughout the week, every single week, because we know we can't do it every week together outside of this time. In Acts 2, the apostles summoned the full number of the disciples. They brought all of the, all those who were, I'm going to say, I'm going to use the word members, even though it's before the you know, the church has its real structure yet, right? It's the church has been formed and is being formed and, 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 and Paul's letters haven't been written yet. And so we don't see all of the structure that Paul lays out in his epistles, his letters. Uh, but the apostles see that a need, right? There are some widows who are being neglected in the distribution of the food. And so they're trying to solve this problem. So what they do, they, they summon the church together. They summon the number of disciples, the full number. They try to get everybody there. What does that mean? It means they knew who they were. Hey, let's get, make sure this family is here. Let's get this family here. They knew who one another were. And when someone said, hey, we're, we're meeting over at whoever's house, come on over for this meeting, they wouldn't say, well, wait, what? You know, it wouldn't have been this confusion. No, they knew who one another were. They told some of the full number of disciples and they said, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Choose from among yourselves. In other words, work together. And, and, and put your heads together and pray about this together and, and, and appoint godly men who are full of the Spirit to these tasks. 1 Corinthians 5. Now, this is a harder one to look at. 1 Corinthians 5, he says, It is actually reported among you, Paul says. It is actually reported among you that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that's not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among, among you. For though I am absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on this individual, on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled, in other words, when you gather together and in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Do you see the goal there? Now, we're going to come back to this passage in 1 Corinthians at some point. I don't know when, but we need to because there's a whole lot here. But one of the things that we see is this. When you are assembled, when you gather together in the name of the Lord Jesus, right? And he says, and I'm there, I'm with you in spirit. You're to deliver this man over to Satan. In other words, you communicate. You're living in a grievous way, 
we have to repent because we haven't been grieved about it yet. So the church has to repent first. Then they'd grieve and they're to mourn. They repent and they come together. Have a solemn assembly. Could look like a lot of different things. And if this individual won't repent, then they put him out of the church, essentially communicating based on the way you're living, grievous sin, known sin, right? This isn't like, oh, whoops, I messed up. Oh, you're out of here. We're not talking about anything like that. I think you know that. You are to put him out of you. Why? For the destruction of his flesh. In other words, if an individual is a child of God, we understand that the Bible says that as they're living out among the world, they will realize that their ways are disastrous. They will realize that they don't want to live according to the flesh and repent and, or maybe get saved for the first time and say, you know what, I was masquerading as a Christian and be broken and come back. And we celebrate when that happens. Right? They don't live with a scarlet letter. No, we celebrate when one who was put out in love comes back. And that was all under the heading of members' meetings. But that's when that would happen, when we're together as a body. And we disciple other church members. I read this already earlier. Rather, speaking the truth, uh, truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Jesus, into head, into I'm sorry, into him who is the head, into Christ, for whom the whole body joined and held together with which it is equipped, when it, each part is working properly, makes its body so that it builds itself up in love. You want a pastoral job description? That's it. You want a dis- job description for elders? That's it. You want a job description for every church member? That's it. It's not comprehensive, but it covers the main ideas. Number six, we share the gospel with others. Right? I love 2 Corinthians 5. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all this is from God, who through Christ has reconciled us to himself and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, not counting our trespasses uh, 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 I skipped part of it. That is, verse 19, that is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. In other words, we are sent ones who go and we represent another's message. It's not our message. It's God's message. We're to deliver it in God's manner, with God's words. Why? Because God is making his appeal through us. And we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Follow your leaders, number seven. A couple verses from Timothy, 2 Timothy. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. A couple chapters later, he says, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, and my steadfastness, my persecutions and my sufferings that happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and in Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. He's saying, Timothy, you're an example in this. Keep it up. Keep going. Bring others with you. Lastly, Hebrews 13, 17 the writer of Hebrews says, obey your leaders and submit to them. Now, that we bristle. Can we just be honest and say we bristle at that? No, I don't like that decision. Well, then what are we going to do? Do you want to make all the decisions? Look at how he ends this passage. He says, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. That's the weightiness of serving as a pastor elder. 
And we don't do it right every time. We, we, we'll tell you as a group, ask any one of us. We blow it. And he says, but let them do this with joy and not with groaning. Because that would be of no advantage to you. In other words, we're a body. And if somebody walks up and says, hey, tell me about your family, your church. Say, so, you know, there's no one-man show here. And at the end of the day, we, we gather around Jesus. He's the head of our family. Jesus is the head of our family. We have under shepherds who serve us. Some are on staff and some have other day jobs, but they work together to pastor and shepherd the church family and to pray for us and to study the Bible and teach it to us in ways that are helpful. And We have deacons and many others who serve the church family in a variety of ways. But you know, at the end of the day, we're thankful that we have leaders, but at the end of the day, we come together as a body we come together as a body. Why? Well, because we're just, we're just members of each other. And in fact, if somebody has gone for several weeks, we feel it. Why? Because we walk with a limp. That's our church. When one part of the body is hurting, one part of the body aches, you start to feel it after a little while because you compensate in other parts of the body. And so now that part of your body is sore because you've been carrying the weight of what's been hurting over here. It doesn't mean it was sinful or wrong. It just means some pressure has needed to be taken off of this individual. And maybe that pressure is felt somewhere else in the church. And so we're a, we're a body that walks kind of like with a limp a lot of times. But one day we won't hurt anymore. In, in fact, one day we're going we're gonna to go from being engaged or betrothed to married to Jesus in the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we won't cry anymore. We won't grieve anymore. We won't struggle anymore. And we'll get to worship God for all of eternity with one another, joining our hands together, or maybe not because we'll all be face down on the ground praising the name of Jesus and worshiping him and saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. That's, that's who we are. It feels a little awkward right now because we're still here on earth and we all struggle with sin, but we know who we are. We're family. Being built into a building. A body. aiming to please Jesus, however imperfectly, but knowing that each one of us is responsible to do the part that God has created us for, equipped us to do, and commissioned us to do by His grace and for His glory.